Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for part two of our series on hyperspectral data for land and coastal systems. My name is Amber McCollum, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Juan Torres Perez and Zach Benston. For this training, we will have three sessions, each being one and a half hours long. So we started last Tuesday on January 19th. Today's the 26th, and we will have one final session next week on February 2nd. The same material will be presented twice per day to ensure participation from folks all around the world. Note that you only need to attend one session per day. And you can find all of the course materials on the website listed here. There is only one prerequisite for this training, an understanding of the basics of remote sensing with our course on those concepts listed here. Also, here's the website again, where you can find the lecture materials, a link to watch the session recordings, and the homework. For this series, we will have one homework assignment. The link to the homework will be made available during the last session and will be due on Tuesday, February 16th. So do look out for that link next week. The homework will be a Google form that you will submit online. If you attend all the sessions and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of completion. Please be patient as these take a few months to process and send out. As mentioned, this series will consist of three sessions. During this, during this, the first session, we provided a general overview of hyperspectral data. In today's session, we'll give specific case study examples of how hyperspectral data for land management can be used. Then for the final session, we will focus on coastal and ocean systems. By the end of this session, you will be able to illustrate how hyperspectral data can be used for monitoring land-based ecosystems, recall many case study examples of hyperspectral-based research and management projects such as agricultural monitoring, invasive species, forest monitoring, and more. And finally, you'll be able to apply techniques to access, download, and display hyperspectral data. So let's review some land-based applications of hyperspectral data. In the first session, we briefly mentioned various applications of hyperspectral data and discussed specific sensors of interest. So today, we will provide examples on how those data are used for agriculture, forest health and restoration, invasive species, drought and vegetation monitoring, geologic and microbial mapping, and finally, hazard detection. Um, such as volcanic activity and landslides. In the image on the top, you can visualize various sugarcane varieties with these data. And in the image on the bottom, you can see the San Andreas Fault along a ridgeline. The first example focuses on mapping agricultural crop types. As the global population increases, we face increasing demand for food and nutrition. Remote sensing can provide, remote sensing can help monitor crop types, food availability, and crop health to improve global food security. Multispectral sensors can be limited in their study of agricultural crop characteristics, such as differentiating crop types and their growth stages with a high degree of accuracy and detail. In contrast, hyperspectral data contain contiguous narrow bands that provide a complete and detailed spectral signature rather than a few data points along a spectrum, and hence can help advance the study of crop characteristics. So for this project, a team of researchers conducted a detailed study of five leading world crop types, corn, soybean, soybean winter wheat, rice, and cotton that occupy 75% of principal crop areas in the United States and 54% in the world. The project was conducted in seven agroecological zones of the United States, 
using 99 Hyperion hyperspectral images from 2008 to 2015 at 30 meter spatial resolution. The researchers developed a first of its kind comprehensive Hyperion derived hyperspectral imaging spectral library of agricultural crops. And these are based on uh, the USDA cropland data layer as reference data. Principal component analysis was used to eliminate redundant bands by using factor loadings to determine which bands most influence the first few principal components. This resulted in the establishment of 30 optimal hyperspectral narrow bands for the study of agricultural crops. In this figure, you can see the differences in reflectance of corn in two agricultural zones. And in the images, you can see some of the study team members and the crops that they examined. I also want to note that we have the link here to the uh, publication of this research. For this work, crop types and crop growth stages were classified in Google Earth Engine. As you can see in these multiple Hyperion scenes on the left, and the small classified images of corn, cotton, rice, soybean, and winter wheat. The best overall accuracies were between 75 to 95 percent in classifying crop types and their growth stages. You can also see the associated spectral signatures of a few of these crop types in the figures on the right to show how the researchers were able to distinguish these crop types based on the reflectance from the hyperspectral images. This research makes a significant contribution towards understanding modeling, mapping, and monitoring agricultural crops using data from uh, even from upcoming hyperspectral satellites. And these could be from NASA's Surface Biology and Geology mission and contributions in advancing the building of a novel, first of its kind, global spectral library of agricultural crops. So this was a really important um, research um, activity. In the next example shown here, we highlight a project conducted within NASA's DEVELOP internship program. Here the team used hyperspectral data from Avris to monitor wildfire restoration in the Santa Monica Mountains. This region is about 63,000 hectares and lies between Ventura and Los Angeles County here in California. It's located within one of the top 25 global biodiversity hotspots. The area is home to 12 vegetation communities, which include California walnut, California bay laurel, coast live oak woodland, valley oak savanna, and riparian woodland. These vegetation communities provide valuable ecosystem services, such as carbon sequestration, slope stability, and temperature moderation, and provides billions of dollars in ecosystem services to the Los Angeles region. The recent Wolseley fire that occurred in November of 2018 has damaged this sensitive area further by burning a large section of this recreation area. The team here worked closely with partners from multiple agencies including the Resource Conservation District of the Santa Monica Mountains, the National Park Service, the California Department of Parks and Rec, and many others. The project identified locations where woodlands will persist under future climate conditions and built upon past work that mapped existing conditions, as well as burn severity and climate variables. So here you can see the spectral reflectance profiles from various species within the region. Using Avris flights, the team was able to differentiate vegetation prior to the Woolsey fire in order to inform managers of the types of species to use for post-fire restoration activities. These spectral profiles were used in a land cover classification map of the region prior to the fire. So here is the final classification map from this project shown here on the left. 
On the right, you can also see the surface area of each land class. <clears throat> Chaparral was the largest class, followed by coastal sage scrub. You can see the extent of these species in the figure, and then the total area and percent of total class covered in the table on the right. These results were also used in species distribution models under specific climate scenarios to help inform managers of the best species to plant for their restoration activities. Another use for hyperspectral data is for invasive species monitoring and management. Again, the ability to distinguish different species provides a, an enormous benefit for these types of studies. Perennial pepperweed is an invasive species that typically threatens wetlands, marshes, and estuarine ecosystems by pushing out native species. Densely packed colonies and white flowers help make pepperweed more distinguishable from native vegetation and identifiable with hyperspectral data. This study used HIMAP, um, which is hyperspectral data that was collected in the San Francisco Bay, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta Estuary of California. And they used this to detect these uh, infestations of pepperweed. HIMAP is an airborne imaging spectrometer that samples the wavelengths of 450 to 2,500 nanometers with 128 uh, bands at 15 to 20 nanometers apart. This was commercially produced by the High Vista Corporation, so I don't believe these data are freely available, but it gives you an example of the use of um, these type of hyperspectral systems. I also wanted to mention that this project too began with the NASA Develop Internship Program and was completed by researchers at UC Davis. And with all of the um, published examples that we're giving, again, we have the link to um, the paper here so you can get more information about the specific project. So here's a map that identifies the location of pepperweed in red for one of the study sites examined called Rush Ranch. At Rush Ranch, most pepperweed occurs in a band along the marsh margin. However, pixels of pepperweed were also identified within the marsh proper. And these detections were confirmed using aerial photographs. This is significant because it indicates that pepperweed is invading areas that are unlikely to be detected by traditional ground-based mapping. The profiles on the right show a distinct spectral signature differentiating pepperweed from other vegetation types, with the pepperweed spectral signature noted with the solid black line. The result was the successful identification of invasive infestations in the area. There are limitations, however, and knowledge of the study region and phenological characteristics of these individual species can assist in creating highly accurate maps of invasive species extent. Another example here is for monitoring severe droughts in the Amazon also done with Hyperion imagery. Some scientists are predicting that El Nino events will become more frequent and severe as Earth's climate warms. Large-scale deforestation and smoke from biomass burning interfere with local cloud formation and rainfall. Identifying the precise signals of drought-stressed forests would benefit the region's farmers, timber operators, fire planners, and conservationists. Being able to detect those changes from a satellite would be a huge advantage, particularly in the Amazon, where there is a where it's a very large region and remote and difficult to access um, on foot in many cases. The other issue, especially in the Amazon, is with clouds. So cloud cover is often prevalent in this region. Additionally, vegetation health indices, like the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, from multispectral imagers like Landsat, 
um, can saturate at high biomass levels, which make it really difficult to determine small variations in the health of dense forests like the Amazon. Therefore, with so many wavelengths to choose from with hyperspectral imagery, there's a much better chance of detecting the changes in pigment activity, leaf area, and carbon balance related to drought. So here you can see images indicating the test sites for um, the, the test sites that these researchers used for a drought plot and a control plot. And at the control plot, they supplemented with water during a drought period. And this helped them identify differences in vegetation health in 2001, which was a pretty severe drought for this region. I also want to mention that in our demonstration for um, accessing and displaying Hyperion imagery that we'll have at the end of this session, we're going to be using data from this same region. In this study, um, the team of researchers showed that Hyperion provided improved estimates of drought in this region. Reflectance was measured in July and November of 2001, that drought year. The use of Hyperion data provided three new indicators that could only be made from hyperspectral observations. One that was sensitive to the amount of the chlorophyll helper pigment called xanthophyll and one that was sensitive to a pigment, pigment called anthocyan, and another that was sensitive to water content in the leaves in the forest canopy. These indicators that made use of the new hyperspectral information from Hyperion were much more successful in detecting changes in carbon content brought about by drought stress. The top graph shows reflectance measured by Hyperion at wavelengths between 450 and 1250 nanometers in July with the blue lines and in November with the orange lines. The forest reflected very little visible light, that from about 450 to 700 nanometers, because that's the type of light that plants generally absorb for photosynthesis. The lower graph shows the visible reflectance in greater detail. Dashed lines show wavelengths used for satellite-based estimates of carbon uptake. Green for vegetation greenness, purple for light use efficiency, and red for the activity of anthocyan, that chlorophyll helper pigment. So the satellite-based cal calculations of net carbon intake came very close to matching the growth that was measured by the researchers on the ground. Another example is the identification of sulfur deposits high in the Canadian Arctic. So this is a glacier carved valley that is unlike no other on Earth. Bjork Ford Pass on Ellesmarie Island, shown in the top image, is the only known place where sulfur from a natural spring is deposited over ice. The sulfur leaves a pale yellow stain that almost seems to glow with the hyperspectral data. And here, um, again, we're talking about Hyperion. At the spring, hydrogen sulfide gas in the water is converted to stable deposits of either elemental, elemental sulfur, um, which is the most common type of material in this deposit, or gypsum. The process by which hydrogen sulfide becomes sulfur is complex and most often occurs when microbes like bacteria are present. The very presence of elemental sulfur deposits is also an indicator that life is likely there. So this type of research could help inform scientists about life on other celestial bodies like Jupiter's moon in Europa. Um, to see if elemental sulfur deposits al also contain life. Um, so quite a bit different than our vegetation studies, but also a very unique and interesting uh, application of hyperspectral data here. Okay, so the final example that we'll highlight today involves the ability to map various mineral types. Volcanic rock avalanches and debris flows are potentially deadly natural phenomena 
um, capable of in, uh, destroying entire communities with little warning. The potential source areas of volcanic debris flows or unstable rock masses situated high on volcanic edifices are one of the important considerations for assessing debris flow hazards. Mapping altered rock and the associated structures can aid in the identification of weakened zones on volcanoes that may be prone to catastrophic collapse. However, because such rocks and structures are commonly situated in rugged terrain that's difficult to access, information concerning potential potential altered rock sources for debris flows is really sparse. Therefore, hyperspectral data from Avaris and Hyperion were used in this example to map a variety of mineral species on Mount Shasta in California. Here are two mineral classification maps from Avaris on the left and Hyperion on the right. The maps display various minerals that are highly altered and particularly prone to landslides. The letters on the map indicate places where there were also ground samples collected. There was fairly good agreement between the Avaris and Hyperion maps. However, the lower signal to noise ratio of Hyperion did create some uncertainties in the map. However, having less snow in the Hyperion image provided some benefit as well, as these were taken at different time periods. Comparisons of the imagery and a digital elevation data set acquired from both airborne and spaceborne sensors demonstrates the feasibility for remotely evaluating altered rock masses that indicate potential volcanic uh, debris flow in the, these regions. So it's another uh, great example of the use of these types of data. So now we will move on to briefly review data access and display per, before providing you with our short demonstration for today. One of the most useful websites for accessing remote sensing data is the USGS Earth Explorer. And we've talked about this in many of our other trainings as well. And this is what we'll be using to highlight our demonstration of downloading Hyperion data. And I also want to mention that Earth Explorer is used for many other types of data, such as multispectral data as well. So it's a, a great resource. Within Earth Explorer, you can specify many aspects of your data of interest to narrow your search. These search criteria include things like the data product type, the sensor of interest, the spatial extent, the date range, and the percent cloud cover. And we often use a threshold of about 20% uh, for the cloud cover uh, designation to eliminate cloudy scenes that oftentimes are not very useful for, our, for this type of analysis. And we've also included the link to Earth Explorer here. In order to download data from Earth Explorer, you will need to sign up for an account through the USGS registration system. And here's a screenshot of what the registration looks like. Once you register, you'll be able to download data and you'll be notified via email when a request has been received and when a request has been processed. So for today's demo, we'll be using Hyperion data. As we discussed in the first session, Hyperion, one of the most popular hyperspectral satellite systems, was launched in November 2000 and was decommissioned in 2017. The Earth Observing EO1 satellite was planned as a one-year technology demonstration validation mission. After the initial technology mission was completed, NASA and the USGS agreed to the continuation of EO1 uh, data as an extended mission. It collected 220 unique spectral channels ranging from 357 to 2,576 nanometers with a 10 nanometer bandwidth. It has a spatial resolution of 30 meters for all of the bands. 
and the full data archive are now available online, which is what we'll show you. Hyperion data are available at different processing levels. The higher the processing level, the greater the pre-processing that was conducted on the imagery prior to when the user downloads it. Pre-processing involves radiometrically correcting data to account for differences in the sensor sensitivity or the gray levels. For the level one GST data, the geometric corrections are derived from spacecraft. And for the level one T data, ground control points are also used to correct the data. Both the level one GST and level one T data are corrected while employing a 90 meter digital elevation model or DEM. And this ensures that topographic accuracy are provided within that GeoTIFF format. The level one R data have further corrections applied and they are provided in an HDF format. As with most satellite data products, the level one processing provides data as radiance. And then additional processing must be done to obtain surface reflectance. And those are the values that are generally used for the spectral analysis. For most multispectral data, this is already done by a processing center. Um, so things like Landsat, for example, you'll obtain a level two surface reflectance product, which makes the data a little easier to work with. For Hyperion data, on the other hand, an atmospheric model must be applied by the user. A few of these include the fast line of sight atmospheric analysis of spectral hypercubes or flash model, the atmospheric correction now or ACORN model, and the atmospheric removal program. For many of the atmospheric correction models, you need a more advanced processing software such as NV. This figure shows that the application of the flash algorithm um, within the Hyperion imager, imagery in NV. The flash algorithm can be applied and then the surface reflectance values can be obtained from the initial radiance values. Then the files can be exported in GeoTIFF formats such as surface reflectance and used in other geospatial software like QGIS or ArcGIS. The application of these atmospheric correction models is a bit beyond the scope of this training, but I wanted to mention it because it's really important to understand that it's a necessary step in the process if you are using hyperspectral data for your work. So we will be doing a demonstration of um, displaying Hyperion data using QGIS. And you don't need to have this downloaded on your computer or anything for this training. It's just going to be a demonstration of what can be done. Um, but QGIS is a really great free and open source GIS platform that has many remote sensing uh, data processing capabilities. And we've used this in a lot of our other RSET trainings as well. Uh, you can download QGIS on a Mac and a PC, and we've included the download link here if you're interested. In. Also, a nice feature about QGIS is the ability to install plugins, and there are a few relevant plugins for hyperspectral data. The first is the Spectral Library tool, which creates spectral libraries of multi and hyperspectral data and allows the user to visualize the spectra via plots. The raster data plotting is another tool that adds a panel for creating pixel profile plots as well as um, scatter density plots for, for multiple bands. The scatter plot data ad adapts in real time. So whenever you move the map canvas, the extent changes. So that's a really nice feature as well. And finally, the semi-automatic classification plugin allows for supervised classification of remote sensing images and provides tools for downloading and processing images. It's a really great tool that was featured um, a few years ago in one of the RSET trainings that we gave, but I'm not sure if it's up to date with the most recent version of QGIS, so that's just something to keep in mind. 
Okay, so now we will move on to the demonstration, which will be given by my colleague, Zach. So Zach, over to you. All right, thank you, Amber. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and be walking you all through our Earth Explorer and QGIS demo here. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and start out in Earth Explorer. Um, if you'll remember on one of the previous slides, uh, there's the link to Earth Explorer. Um, this is kind of the main screen that you'll see when you first uh, go to this website. Um, as Amber mentioned, you'll need to register for a login. Um, so it's usually just easiest with Earth Explorer kind of before you start looking at data, um, before you start looking through the imagery that you're interested in to go ahead and just log in. Um, that kind of prevents you from uh, reaching any barriers um, to downloading data, um, creating a basket where you might want to uh, kind of house all of your bulk downloads, things like that. Um, so I go ahead and recommend uh, just logging into Earth Explorer um, kind of once you get to this main screen. Um, so now we can get to kind of the, the data search portion of Earth Explorer. Um, there's a lot of criteria that you can enter for Earth Explorer. Um, uh, I think probably the biggest one uh, that most of you are probably interested in is spatial extent. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just establish uh, kind of a study area that we'll be working with in Earth Explorer. Um, so there's a, a variety of search criteria that you can use, as I mentioned. Um, you have a lot of options here. Um, you can even upload your own shapefile if you uh, so wish. That's something that you have the option to do. Um, you can use the geocoder um, to look for specific features. Um, that includes US features, things like states, um, cities, counties, stuff like that, and then world features as well. Um, which you can use to filter for country, a feature class, feature type, um, things like that. You also have the option um, to define an area uh, kind of using this, this browser interface that we he have here on the side. So we'll go ahead and do some of that. You can define uh, your own polygon, um, basically adding uh, a coordinate uh, in four corners and whatever shape you so desire uh, to create your own polygon. Um, as Amber mentioned, we're gonna be using data uh, from uh, the Amazon Basin um, that's from the same project as uh, the case study that we used uh, from the Amazon. So uh, here you can define a specific uh, lat long point. You can get a radius from that. So you can get a circle as your kind of study area there. Um, you can use a predefined area. As I mentioned, you can add your own shape. I think probably the easiest thing to do, especially if you're just looking to browse, is to just use the extent of the map. And so how that works is you kind of zoom in on what you're interested in, um, and you can just use the map frame. And then as you see here, um, it, will, it will kind of log all of those points for you and provide this square polygon. And so with that, you can kind of manipulate that shape to um, whatever shape you're interested in. You can extend the spatial range, you can make it a little bit more fine, um, and then in my opinion, that's probably the easiest way to kind of just start um, filtering data for spatial extent. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, you can do a lot of data, data filtering steps here at the get-go, um, things like date range, cloud cover, um, results options, um, but there's actually a, a point later on where you can uh, look at additional criteria, um, and we'll go ahead and go over these steps then. Um, so you can go ahead and go to the next step once you've defined your spatial area. Um, and this is where you select what data sets you're interested in working with. So for our purposes, we're gonna be working with Hyperion data, and that can be found here nested under EO1, and you're just gonna to wanna to click the EO1 Hyperion checkbox. And so that will just make sure that all of the data that you're seeing is from EO1 Hyperion. And so we'll go ahead and go to additional criteria. Um, and this is where you can specify things like entity ID. That's kind of just using some of the, the data from satellite imagery capture. Uh, to go ahead and filter for your results. Um, you definitely have to know a little bit more specific information about what scenes um, you're interested in working with. Um, so it's not necessarily the, the easiest uh, input to filter your data. Um, you can also look at processing level of data. Um, as we mentioned, uh, there's three level one products available for Hyperion. You can go ahead and select one if you're, if you're interested in receiving that product in particular. Um, but we're gonna go ahead and just leave that on all for our purposes. And then for cloud cover, um, as we mentioned before, we typically look for images that have no more than 20% cloud cover. So we're gonna go ahead and click that less than 20% um, box right there. You can also uh, define things like path and row if you know exactly um, where the imagery is located that you're looking for. 
Um, but for our purposes, this should be a good search, basically uh, defining the spatial extent, um, picking our sensor, and then making a cloud cover specification as well. So we'll go ahead and start looking at our results. So Earth Explorer will go ahead and filter through all of the Hyperion data and only provide us with data that's available within this uh, spatial extent. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of data here. Um, but we'll go ahead and go up here to the show results control. And this is a really nice way to uh, look at the various different footprints of the data. There's a couple options here. Um, we'll go ahead and choose this footprint one. Awesome. So as you can see, these are the Hyperion, oops, went a little too far there. These are the Hyperion overpasses that we have access to kind of within that study area that we defined. So you can see each one of them individually and they're reflected here. Um, and you can kind of turn uh, these uh, color markers on and off to, to see exactly where each of these data points lies. So kind of looking at the data that you have available, um, you'll be able to look at the metadata. So you wanna click this little thumbnail image right here and that'll go ahead and load the metadata for you. It'll give you things like acquisition date, it'll give you cloud cover, um, target path row, um, as well as the time that the image was captured. Um, so this is really helpful metadata information um, that will kind of help you narrow down whether or not this data is important to you. Um, this image in particular is from 2016. And you can also do kind of a standard browse of the imagery where you can just go ahead and take a look at the thumbnail. You can inspect for obvious um, imagery areas. Um, this is kind of a false color image um, that you can just go ahead and explore through to see if there's cloud cover, to see if there's missing pixels, maybe some image artifacts that you're not necessarily uh, too keen on for your own data analysis. Um, and kind of once you've determined uh, that the data that you've filtered through is something you're interested in, you can either kind of download one by one. And so you do that with this icon here. And then it will provide you for all of those download options that we went over earlier. And what you'll do if you want this data um, is you'll just go ahead and click the download button, say for the level one R product that you're interested in, and that'll just go ahead and directly download um, into your downloads folder. Um, I'm not gonna do any downloads for myself for the next portion of the demo because I already have some uh, level two pre-processed data um, that we're gonna be working with for the QGIS demonstration. Um, so I'll go ahead and start moving everything over into QGIS and we can get started with that portion of the demo. All right, so now that we're here in the QGIS interface, um, this is kind of the main screen that pops up. Um, you'll see a couple of things that you don't necessarily really need to pay attention to with QGIS. Um, for example, like the news or project templates. Um, we're not gonna deal with any of that right now. Um, that's just what you can expect when you first open the application. Um, and so we'll go ahead up to here to the new project button and we'll just go ahead and click new project. And once we click that button, it'll just kind of populate this new blank project. Um, and then we'll need to go ahead and import our data. And so as a reminder, the, the data that I'm using has been processed to uh, level two. That means that um, it's been processed through atmospheric corrections um, and it will be displaying surface reflectance. Um, this is from the same project uh, that uh, that we uh, showed the case study for um, in the Amazon uh, throughout our case study presentation slides. Um, uh, but this data is based off of the level one products that we went off of. Um, it's just already gone through that uh, atmospheric correction processing phase. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and open uh, the data layer that we're looking for here in the data source manager. I mean, as you can see here, um, you have options to import a vector data layer, um, a raster data layer, data layer um, mesh layer. Um, we're interested in rasters. And as you can see here, I already have preloaded um, the TIFF that has the level to uh, surface reflectance data that we'll be working with uh, from the Amazon Basin. But I'll just go ahead and show you real quickly how to navigate to whatever file you're interested in working with with QGIS. I mean, you'll just go here to the Browse button and that will take you here to browse through each of your files. and you can go ahead and click on the one that you're interested in working with. In this case, it's a TIFF, and it's the, the same file that was already preloaded. Um, so we'll go ahead and add that to the project. And you can see there, it adds everything in the background. Um, this interface here might not necessarily close. Um, you can just go ahead and close it. Um, and you see here we have um, uh, the first band, which is the gray band, kind of displayed here within our project. Um, you can see the layer over here. 
um, displayed uh, similar to if you're used to working with ArcGIS or another GIS platform, you can turn those layers on and off. And we'll just go ahead and zoom, zoom here to a clear part of the swath. You can see there's some interference from clouds and other portions of the image, um, but for the most part, it's relatively cloud-free. And you'll notice that a lot of those cloud pixels get filtered out um, during the atmospheric correction phase um, of data processing. But we'll go ahead and zoom in here to kind of uh, this clearer portion of the image. And then what we're gonna wanna do is go ahead and uh, do an RGB band combination. So that's red, green, blue. And we'll just be picking uh, different bands from, uh, from this image uh, so that we can create um, a quasi true color image that's gonna look a lot more like what we would expect. Um, so as I mentioned, this is kind of just showing the gray band for now. It's a nice outline of what's contained within the image. Um, but we'll go over here to the layer styling pane. And if this doesn't open up when you first import the image, you can just go to this button right here and click on that. And that should open this interface for you right here. And so it's pretty easy when you're creating that RGB image. Um, you can kind of just go through and click which bands you're interested in working with. Um, for this data product, we have 196 bands um, that kind of pass that quality control phase and are useful for the analysis that was done uh, for this project. I mean, you can see all of those data, uh, all of those bands displayed here kind of in a one through 96 format. Um, and then I have the associated metadata um, that tells me what wavelength each of these bands corresponds to. So the first, um, I wanna say 70 or so bands correlate to the visible uh, part of the spectrum. And those are the ones that we're gonna be interested in working with. And so we'll go ahead and start out with the red band here, um, which will be band 27 in this case. And that corresponds to around 620 nanometers um, in wavelength. For our green band, we're gonna choose band 20. Um, and this band uh, correlates to around 400, sorry, 548 nanometers um, around that range. And then for the blue band, um, we're going to choose uh, band 12. Um, and that band is around uh, 460 nanometers. And so, as you can see here, kind of with that combined red, green, blue image, um, we have a little bit more of what we would expect out of uh, a quasi true color image close to a true color image um, that looks more like what we'd expect to see kind of from that satellite. I mean, one thing that I wanna note here is that you can kind of play around with these bands to see how um, the image differs, how certain parts of the image might be highlighted when you change some of these band combinations. So example, we can, for example, we can start with the green band here um, say we wanted to change that to 16. You can notice that certain areas that are vegetated change in color and are highlighted. And that's just because uh, depending on the vegetation species, there's gonna be a different uh, band that potentially um, is reflected more frequently by that type of vegetation. Um, so for example, if you wanted to change that to 22, you could see again, um, it looks a lot more like the original image that we created, um, but you just have those options there to kind of mess around with the bands um, and see what type of land cover types you might you might be able to uh, kind of highlight just by doing some simple experimentation with the bands. And so we're gonna go ahead and, I went ahead and put that back to kind of our original quasi true color image. Um, and on top of that, you'll be able to use uh, the value tool in QGIS. This is a, a plugin that's really easy to, to install on your machine. Um, and I'll go up here to the, the plugins manager so you can, click here in this tab, manage and install plugins. Um, and then you can just do a quick search um, after it's done connecting to the, the plugin manager. Um, you can see there, there's um, 629 plugins currently available for this version of QGIS. Um, and if you were interested in the value tool, you just have to type it in here in the search bar. It'll pop up and it's pretty easy to just install really quickly um, in your interface in QGIS. But we'll go ahead and enable the value tool. Um, and this is gonna allow us to uh, start exploring uh, the image pixel by pixel, looking at uh, different spectral profiles across the image. And so we'll go here to the graph and I'll just go ahead and set a quick um, max and min. Uh, this changes uh, the maximum and minimum in the plot for uh, the Y axis, um, which is surface reflectance in this case. And the only reason I'm doing that um, is to just make that first portion of the bands a little bit easier to view. Um, like I mentioned, we're really just interested in kind of that first half of the bands, um, which display um, uh, the visible part of the spectrum that we're really interested in working with. 
Um, so I went ahead and changed that. And then we're gonna go ahead and just toggle over here to the image. It'll take a second to load. Okay, awesome. And so when we toggle over different portions of the image, we can see different uh, spectral profiles um, populating in the first um, 80 or so bands that we're really interested in working with, like I mentioned. Um, you can see here, if you toggle over different parts of the image, um, you'll see different spectral responses, different spectral profiles. So we have a very heavily forested area here, um, and the spectral profile of that has its own kind of distinct shape to it. And then we can go over here to some more bare surface, um, different types of land cover, and we can see how that spectral profile changes. Um, and then we can even toggle over, say, um, this river area and see kind of what the reflectance looks like um, in, in the water itself. So this is a, a really cool way to go ahead and start exploring um, what spectral profiles you can expect from your imagery, um, whether or not there's a way to, to differentiate between different, um, say, vegetation types based off of that spectral profile. Um, that's definitely something that you can get a little bit more in depth with, but for the purposes of this training, um, we just wanted to show you a really quick and easy way to go ahead and start exploring what some of those spectral profiles look like. And with that, I think I'll go ahead and hand it back over to Amber. Amber, back to you. Thank you, Zach, for that great demonstration. And in summary for today's session, we highlighted many of the land-based applications of hyperspectral data. These applications focus on the primary benefits of hyperspectral data, including the ability to differentiate between vegetation species which can be useful for things like agriculture, forest health and restoration, invasive species, and so much more. And the ability to distinguish between small differences in vegetation health and chlorophyll content, which can be used for drought or forest health, and can help in the identification of mapping mineral deposits, which can be useful for identification of hazards, uh, especially with um, things related to landslides. We also discussed how hyperspectral data can be accessed via the data portal Earth Explorer. However, it's really important to remember that processing is required to account for influences such as geometric and atmospheric, and mo most of the data are available as radiance, which necessitates the uh, conversion into surface reflectance prior to generating those spectral signatures. So these are some things to keep in mind when using hyperspectral data. And then finally, we demonstrated how to access and visualize Hyperion data. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today and um, do please come back with us next week where we're going to have a session focused primarily on coastal and ocean applications. So thanks again, and we will now move into the question and answer portion of this training. All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Give us a moment while we uh, move over to pull up the um, Q&A document. Um, a couple of reminders. Uh, we will have the homework, the link to the homework available next week. So do please check back on the website on February 2nd. Um, and do please join us for our, our next week's session where we're going to focus more on coastal and ocean applications of hyperspectral data. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, we've been noticing a lot of questions, uh, in particular uh, related to specific questions about some of the research we um, gave as examples, and we're not the researchers who actually conducted that, um, so we may not know the answer to some of those very specific questions, but we're, we've provided some links and um, as much information as we can related to, to that work. Also, um, there have been a lot of questions about Google Earth Engine. And um, while that's not something we're covering in this training, we uh, are planning to have a Google Earth Engine training uh, coming up in a couple months, actually. 
And that training is going to focus on um, some very uh, basic land applications for the use of Google Earth Engine, things like land cover classification, um, change detection. And so do please check back for more information about um, that training in the next couple of months. Um, so we might not be able to answer some of those questions right now as well. Um, I also wanted to mention, we'll go through the, the questions that we have here, um, and we will also try to provide more uh, elaboration and links and um, information on this Q&A document, and then we will post the Q&A document onto the course website after we've gone through all the questions. So you can use that as a reference later on as well. Um, and if you don't, uh, if you don't get to your specific question and you uh, would like to email us, um, our email addresses for myself, Juan, and Zach are listed here. And again, this will be provided on the Q&A document um, that we post on the website. So we do have a little bit of time for questions. So we'll go through um, some of these questions that you all have posted throughout the, the session. Okay. Question one, how can HDF format be converted to GeoTIFF for further analysis in QGIS? And I don't think there's a straightforward way to do this. Um, as we mentioned with QGIS, this is a free software um, and many of the functionalities are uh, provided through plugins that are created by the geospatial community. Um, I do believe that the plugin GDAL can be used for HDF conversion. I'm not sure if it uh, works with the most up-to-date version of QGIS, um, but that's one thing to, to check, in, check into. Um, we've provided the link to the um, GDAL HDF conversion information here. Another thing I, I wanna stress is that because QGIS is this open source platform um, that is not it's it's designed for geospatial data, but not specifically designed for hyperspectral data um, or really remote sensing to a high degree. It does have a lot of nice remote sensing tools. Um, uh, commercial software such as Envy or AirDOS Imagine might be uh, better suited for, in particular, hyperspectral data that requires a little bit more um, in-depth analysis. So. Um, you do have to pay for those, but but those do have a lot more um, functionality there. Question two, what is the smallest area size we can use for hyperspectral data? So again, this really depends on the sensor you're interested in. We covered some of the um, uh, various types of resolutions, including spatial resolution in the first lecture. Um, and for example, Hyperion has a 30 meter spatial resolution. So that's similar to Landsat. Um, Heiko has a 90 meter spatial resolution. Um, it, with a 30 meter spatial resolution uh, sensor, the, you, you obtain one value of radiance or reflectance if you convert it um, for about the size of a baseball diamond. So um, you do have to keep that in mind and that is one of the limitations of remote sensing data um, when we think about the spatial scale. So it really just depends on what sensor you're using there. Question three, um, hyperspectral data for land, can soil moisture be de determined? Um, that's a good question. We've had that question a couple times. I, I've gotten a few emails about that as well. Um, and I, I don't believe that hyperspectral data is your best bet for, for examining soil moisture. I would suggest using SAR data. Um, SAR data has uh, microwaves that are able to penetrate the ground surface to evaluate the dialectic constant of water, uh, of soil, <laughs> excuse me. So um, that's probably a better bet than trying to use hyperspectral data for something like that. Um, you could check out the SMAP mission, the Soil Moisture Active Passive mission. The, the resolution is quite coarse on that. Um, you can also check out other um, SAR ground penetrating missions like Sentinel-1. Sentinel-1 would be my suggestion. Uh, we do have a couple RSET trainings, um, in particular RSET trainings on the use of SAR um, data, as well as a soil moisture and evaporation training. So you can take a look at that for more information there. 
Okay, question four. How are the bands of a future sensor determined? I'm guessing based on inputs from the scientific community. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's why we mentioned community involvement and input for the upcoming missions of SBG, PACE, and Glimmer. Um, so do please take a look at those links provided in session one to, to get involved. Um, it's a really long process and the, the design of the architecture for a satellite um, is going to depend on a lot of different factors, um, but input from the community on what is needed, especially the applications community, is really valuable for the um, engineers and the architecture development team. So this really, again, de uh, depends on all of those trade-offs, right, that we've discussed before. The trade-off of temporal resolution, spatial resolution, spectral resolution, and what can be done with the instrument design. Um, and also want to mention that um, the data collected from previous missions is really helpful in determining how to create the architecture for future missions. So there are a lot of prototype missions, pilot missions, a lot of the airborne missions that NASA um, conducts provides information to those architecture teams on how they can design a satellite mission. Um, it's a really good question. Okay, question five. What are the approaches of improving signal to noise ratio of spaceborne hyperspectral instruments? Um, and which one is better? Classifier, support vector machine, or random forest for hyperspectral classification? That's a, a really complex question. We have a couple questions about uh, signal to noise ratio. Um, we mentioned briefly a few techniques last week. It's a little beyond the scope of this training, but a few techniques I can recommend are um, principal component analysis, which we talked about quite a bit in the um, Q&A last week too, about the ability of PCA to differentiate, uh, essentially uh, identify spectral bands that are very similar um, and allowing you to choose a band that's the most appropriate for your research and potentially a band that has a lower signal to noise ratio. Um, also singular spectral analysis or SSA, it's very similar to principal component analysis, but it's really useful for non-stationary data. This is a technique that's used in hydrology quite a bit. Um, and then wavelet analysis is another approach. Um, and I, we've listed a few uh, resources for conducting these signal to noise um, uh, techniques, um, but it is it is quite advanced. So um, just a heads up there. Um, and also sometimes there's really not a whole lot you can do. Um, sometimes you have to um, just select the bands that have the lowest signal to noise ratio for whatever target you're interested in. And there's not a, um, a really perfect way to get around that depending on the, the, the way the sensor is designed. Um, so uh, when thinking about image classification, what I really recommend is running multiple techniques because you're not going to know which technique is gonna work the best for you by just running one of them. Um, it's gonna vary depending on your study area, your uh, research interest, and also I always recommend having some kind of ground-based data in order to run an accuracy assessment, right? So we, we need to um, have some kind of ground truth to be able to evaluate the accuracy of our uh, remote sensing data in classifying an image. So um, I really like random forests. I think there are a lot of uh, easy to use approachable techniques. Um, there's there's some great R packages for random forest. Um, it can be done pretty uh, easily in uh, Google Earth Engine. Uh, but again, it, it it's a it it's really going to depend on your region, the data you're using, what you're interested in classifying. And so I recommend multiple techniques, evaluating the accuracy of those techniques against ground ground based information. Um, We've had a couple RSET trainings on this, uh, focused on multispectral data, but the techniques are similar. Um, so we've included those links here on land cover classification, satellite imagery, 
and um, accuracy assessment. And then we'll likely be covering those topics in our upcoming Google Earth Engine training as well. Okay, question six. Oh, um, this question asked about the type of classifier, I think, and I wasn't sure which project they were referring to. Um, and also, I'm not really sure <laughs> because I'm not the one who did this research. But um, if the question was related to the agriculture example, there is a published article related to that. Um, and I've, I've uh, included uh, a little excerpt from that article. Um, they were using linear discriminant analysis as well as um, uh, support vector machines, so um, some kind of uh, neural network learning within Google Earth Engine, it looks like. Um, and I'm not sure about the Santa Monica uh, restoration example, if that's what you're referring to in the question. Um, we could put you in touch with the, the um, group who did that work too. Okay, question seven. How to perform PCA using QGIS or any open source platform? Um, do you have any plan to train on this? Um, no, we don't have a plan to train on this. And it is a little bit beyond the scope of this, but I would recommend um, there, I know there are R packages for PCA. Um, there's a PCA plugin for QGIS that we've listed here. Um, and I, I'm sure there are techniques to do PCA in both Python and Google Earth Engine. Um, so just, I would say, recommend just doing a little Google search on that. Um, uh, but yeah, we don't have a plan on, on going more in depth on, on, on principal component analysis. Okay, next question, eight. Uh, oh, right, um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of Google Earth Engine questions. Um, this is, I was sort of mentioning that, um, I'm sure there's some Google Earth Engine code on doing PCA and classification. Uh, we've provided two links to tutorials there provided by the Google Earth Engine developers. Um, and again, we're, we're hoping to focus a training on, on um, at least classification with Google Earth Engine in the next few months. I don't know if we'll be actually doing any PCA analysis there, but take a look at those tutorials. Next question, question nine. It seems that the spectral shape of different crops on slide 10 looks exactly the same, but the magnitude is different. Is this correct? And how can you be sure that the resulting magnitude is correct after atmospheric correction? It's a great question. And you're right. The, for many of the crop types, when we think about the use of remote sensing for analyzing vegetation, Vegetation in general has these common reflectance and absorption patterns, right? We might see sm small differences, but you're always going to see a peak in the near infrared, right? If you have green, healthy vegetation, for example. Um, and what the researchers, as far as I understand it, have done here is, is really taken a look at the magnitude, but also slight variations in the reflectance the uh, reflectance among different uh, wavelengths. But the magnitudes are really important here. Um, and I know that the, the researchers for this work used a lot of ground-based spectra. So essentially going out into the field and using a uh, spectrometer and uh, obtaining the spectral signature from the ground-based location and then comparing it to the remote sensing imagery, right? So again, ground-based data is really useful in classification. Um, I'm not sure what the researchers did in terms of the atmospheric correction. There might be more information in the paper. Um, but, but yeah, the, the type of correction and the magnitude of uh, correction for the atmosphere can influence your uh, reflectance values. And so it's really important um, that that's, a, that's a done systematically across your imagery um, and that it doesn't interfere with the um, magnitude of the reflectance in certain wavelengths. Um, that generally is not an issue for vegetation as much, but um, that's definitely something to keep in mind and I'm not sure how those researchers dealt with it. 
Also, um, similar to question 10, I think here. I don't know if I'll know the exact answer. It says you are showing average spectra of cotton, corn. What's the variability? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the researchers did here. I'm assuming with the ground-based data um, as well as the remote sensing data, they use some kind of ensemble mean, um, some kind of averaging over the uh, multiple different um, uh, spectral signatures from many different pixels and many different ground-based um, information, but I'm not sure exactly how they, they did that. Um, so I, we've included the link to the paper there as well. Um, but, but that's a great point is you're going to have variability depending on, you know, from, from plot to plot or from pixel to pixel, um, even within um, something that is considered the same class or the same vegetation type. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind when when doing your analysis is the the magnitudes are going to be are going to vary, um, but I'm assuming there is some kind of averaging um, done with the different crop types to get those those spectral plots that we showed. Okay, question 11. Oh, question 11 we addressed earlier. Um, it, again, it's a question about signal to noise ratio and multispectral data versus hyperspectral. The level of uh, signal to noise in multispectral data is generally quite lower when compared to hyperspectral data. So the, there's less of a need for uh, these reduction techniques in multispectral data. Um, so that's another you know, trade off for hyperspectral data, just to be aware of. Okay, next question. Perennial pepperweed, to detect the flower, do you have to acquire data at a spe spe specific time? Um, yeah, so phenology of the plant you're interested in examining is really important, and this can really vary depending on the time of year. Um, it really useful for, uh, you know, using things like NDVI. Um, if you're looking at the green up and the senescence of a particular vegetation. So we've also included a link here um, for more information about perennial pepperweed. And this is similar to question 13 here. And this question asks about the limitations of mapping pepperweed. Um, I would say spatial extent is probably always going to be number one. In certain area, in certain locations, um, this, this invasive species has extended over large, large areas. So it's easy to map via remote sensing. But in other areas, and in partially in the example that we showed, right, where um, the extent is not very uh, broad, it, it's, it can be difficult to distinguish between pepperweed and some kind of mixed signal effects of the surrounding uh, other types of vegetation or um, mud flats or things like that. So um, I would say spatial extent is always number one to consider. And again, that goes back to the sensor you're using and the, the resolution of the data. Um, and then again, phenology. So making sure you have imagery at the right time of year. Um, great. Oh, question 14. Um, so we didn't get to answer this ahead of time and I'm not sure I know the, the, the exact answer to this. Um, the question is, can hyperspectral images differentiate between crops that are very similar, such as, as sorghum and maize? My guess would be no, um, but I'm not, per, I'm not an expert on uh, using hyperspectral data for our agricultural applications, so I could be wrong. <laughs> um, but I would say uh, if, you have, if you have plants that are so spectrally similar, Optical data is not going to be your most useful uh, data of choice, right? Um, if you do have uh, agricultural uh, crops that that are structurally different, um, such as one one crop might be tall and skinny, and another crop might be more bushy, um, SAR data could be used to identify structural differences, and that might might be a better approach than trying to use even hyperspectral data to distinguish those types of different crops. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure on that one, <laughs> um, but something to, to think about, um, maybe looking into SAR data.
might be a different, a better approach. I know the um, Canadian Space Agency does a lot of agricultural mapping with SAR data, so that might be somewhere to look as well. Okay, question 15. Is it possible that to use hyperspectral data to identify different soil types, or at least soil characteristics, water content? If so, po probably only exposed soils, how to classify an accurate and atmospherically correct Hyperion image. A lot, of, a lot of questions here. Is it necessary to have knowledge of uh, MNF and pixel purity? Can we just, okay, I'll go through these one by one. Is it possible to use hyperspectral data to identify different soil types? Potentially. Um, we gave the example of different mineral deposits um, being identified by hyperspectral data. So if if mineralogically they are very different, then it could be possible to identify different soil types. As I've mentioned previously, hyperspectral data is not your best bet for examining soil moisture. There are other um, systems like SMAP or other SAR data like Sentinel-1 that'd be better for that. Um, yes, it's only exposed soils. So with hyperspectral data, it's optical, and therefore it's not ground penetrating. So you're not going to penetrate any kind of canopy that may be overlying a soil. Um, so it does need to be bare soil. Um, how to classify an accuracy, accurate and atmospherically correct Hyperion imagery. Um, that's a little more detailed than what we'll get into for this training. Um, there are other tutorials out there that we've included in some of the previous questions, so do take a look at those. Um, hyperspectral data can be classified in much the same way multispectral data can be classified. Um, the techniques can be similar. You're just using different bands, right? Um, so do please take a look at those. Um, it, the question about pixel purity before classification. Again, um, depending on the target of interest, the spatial resolution of your data, you might have uh, what we call um, mixed pixels, where you have a pixel that is um, combining the reflectance of, say, vegetation and soil. If, if within that pixel, there is both vegetation and soil, depending on how large that pixel is. There are many different types of spectral un, uh, unmixing techniques where you can try to differentiate those different properties within a single pixel, but they're much more advanced than we'll discuss here. Um, and then uh, can you define a region of interest to correct and classify? Again, it depends on, on the software that you're using. Um, for classification of remote sensing images, you can certainly um, clip or mask an image to a smaller region of interest prior to conducting the classification. Um, you can do that very easily in a QGIS or um, ArcGIS type system. Um, I, I believe you can also do that very easily in Google Earth Engine where you define a region of interest and then you're only classifying over that region of interest. Um, and that's just a precursor step. Uh, you can do that using a, a shapefile that you have of the region. You can do that by creating your own um, rectangle or shapefile of the region. Um, so that's certainly an option. A lot of times that's done too to crop out any influence of clouds in an entire scene that you might have. So if you're only interested in a certain area where there are no clouds, but the uh, scene does have clouds, it'll affect your classification. So you want to remove that part of the scene. Um, okay, I think I addressed most of those. Um, all right. Question 16, can we get information about the size structure of soil particles? Again, you're going to need SAR data for that. Hyperspectral data, I don't think, can be really uh, useful for that. Um, SAR data is ground penetrating. Depending on the band of SAR data that you use, uh, you'll be able to um, get information about 
the um, essentially the structure of the soil in terms of if it's very smooth or if it's recently been tilled. Um, yeah, I would take a look at um, SAR data for that. I'm not sure which band in particular is best for soils, but okay. Question 17, are there spectral signatures provided in resources such as USGS specific to hyperspectral data? If yes, are most hyperspectral library or most spectral libraries based on hyperspectral data? Is it possible to use hyperspectral signature with multispectral imagery? Yeah, so the USGS has a really extensive spectral library. We've included the link to that here. Um, generally, there you you can create spectral libraries um, using hyperspectral or multispectral imagery. Um, they're generally more useful for multi, for hyperspectral imagery because um, you're able to distinguish between say different vegetation species. Um, with multispectral imagery, it's very broad classes of vegetation that you are distinguishing between. So you're not really as, it's not really as necessary to have a, a spectral library of a very particular plant species because you're not going to be able to identify that in multispectral data. So I would say they're, they're more useful with hyperspectral data, but certainly um, could be used for multispectral imagery as well. Okay, question 18. Could different ice conditions be determined? For examining ice extent, there are a lot of different um, sensors out there for that. I'd recommend looking into satellites like ICESat. GRACE is, can also be useful for determining the differences in gravitational pull related to changes in water uh, availability globally. Um, it's pretty coarse. Um, but uh, in terms of water balance, GRACE can be very useful. Um, I, we've included a link to a special topic about this. Um, I'm not aware of a lot of hyperspectral applications for ice monitoring, but again, I could be wrong. Question 19, volcanic debris flows, slope is affecting the reflectance. How do you account for the dip? Yeah, I think in this research, the um, the team used a digital elevation model or DEM to identify topographic variability and how it related to the different mineral deposits along the slopes of the volcano. Um, so that's that's a great point. Um, you're going to see different magnitudes in reflectance based on the um, direction of the slope, if it's a north or south facing slope, for example, you'll have differences. We see this a lot in vegetation analysis. Um, that's my, a little bit more familiar with that. Um, but yeah, I think that they, the DEM um, was used to sort of correct for that in some way and also uh, help identify which types of minerals I think would be found on those different slopes. Question 20. Um, does Hyperion have an automated scene classification layer for clouds, haze? Oh, like the cloud layer for Sentinel-2. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I think this needs to be done on an individual basis. Um, there's a link for, we included a link for vegetation classification, but that doesn't really help you with the clouds. Um, I think I misread this when we initially were looking at it. Um, but but I would I would recommend looking into cloud masking techniques similar to what can be done for multispectral data. Um, but I don't think I'm aware of Hyperion offering any kind of cloud mask layer, which is available for some uh, multispectral data, oftentimes. Okay, question 21. Can all the steps in the demo be replicated with ArcGIS Pro? Um, or does Q just provide better options? Um, I would say that ArcGIS and QGIS are very similar in a lot of ways. There are, there are definitely differences, but most of the remote sensing techniques that can be done in one can be done in the other. Um, it, it's just a different process. Um, I will say that uh, with 
with ARC, many of the functionality is built into the system. You know, it's a, it's a commercial software. And with QGIS, many of these techniques are, are available via plugins that are created by the geospatial community. So that's one difference. Um, but again, for a lot of our RSET trainings, we just use QGIS because it's free and open. Um, but, but yeah, I would say, especially looking at different bands, um, doing some initial raster analysis, um, all of that stuff can be done in ARC as well. Okay. Question 22, how is uncertainty commonly determined for hyperspectral data? Um, again, this gets back to the question sort of about accuracy assessment. Um, if you have ground-based validation data, that's gonna be the most useful for um, identifying any kind of uncertainty if you're trying to classify a, a hyperspectral image, for example. Um, you always wanna compare it to some ground validation. Um, and we have a few links here on that. Um, so uncertainty is really gonna depend on the target of interest, what you're mapping, what you're trying to classify, and if you have spectral information about those targets from the ground in order to determine the accuracy of the satellite image. And the same can be said with multispectral data. Okay. Um, I think question 23 is similar to a previous question. Are there methods in Google Earth Engine to apply atmospheric correction on Hyperion data? There might be some out there. I'm, I have never done that myself, um, but I do know that a lot of folks are using Earth Engine just as a, a primary geospatial processing platform. Um, so I'd, I'd go, go ahead and do a little research there. And, and uh, yeah, we, we covered this a little bit in the previous question. Um, but if you, have the, if you have the technique for how to atmospherically correct something, you could write the code for it if you're a coder in <laughs> Python or Java. Okay, question 24. Is there a free spectral library for plastic or anthropogenic waste? That's an interesting question. Um, we, we've included a little answer here. Uh, most researchers in particular when using hyperspectral data are going to build their own spectral libraries. And I don't, I'm not aware of anything that's done on a large scale um, where different types of waste have been um, spectrally mapped. Um, in particular for anthropogenic waste, they, there's a lot of variability, right? So um, there are different colors, different types of waste. Um, this will change depend on, depending on their exposure to the environment. Um, so you can have oxidation happening or decomposition of certain kinds of waste materials. Um, so this might be really variable depending on the kind of waste you are interested in looking at. Um, and again, uh, the best approach here is going out into the field with a um, spectroradiometer and taking these measurements yourself and comparing them to the remote sensing images. Okay, uh, question 25, is Hyperion data available for the whole globe? No, we talked about this quite a bit in the first session uh, and was one of the main limitations of hyperspectral data is that um, not usually globally available. Um, there's a map, a link to uh, uh, Glovis, uh, actually, which is a data portal where you can find Hyperion data. Um, you can see where Hyperion data are available. Again, last week we talked about if you're using a data portal to get some of these imagery, um, you can usually search by a specific spatial extent of interest. Um, so that's a good approach um, going to, uh, place like Glovis or Earth Explorer, and you can select the data of interest and select a spatial extent and then see if there's any data there available. Okay, question 26. I don't understand how the red, green, green, blue bands were assigned in the demo. Ah, 
This is a good question. How did he know which to use? Um, QJS automatically populated the max value for each band, but did not set the minimum. Amber, I can go ahead and take this one if you want. Yeah, that'd be great. Go for it, Zach. Okay, awesome. Uh, so in the demo, uh, we basically were just trying to set the RGB bands um, to their general place within the, the electromagnetic spectrum. So we were looking for wavelengths um, that generally corresponded to red, green, and blue. Um, and so the, the level two product that we were using for that part of the demo um, had just kind of its own specific number assigned to each band out of 196 bands that had passed through quality control um, and, and were use, uh, useful for analysis purposes. Um, and so for the demo, um, kind of knowing what each of those uh, bands corresponded to, uh, the bands that I selected um, were a red band that was around 620 nanometers, a green band that was around 550 nanometers, and a blue band around kind of like 460 nanometers. Um, and so that was kind of just to create our own quasi true color image there, um, which is something that you would expect to see a little bit more uh, commonly in a, in a true color scenario with that satellite imagery. Um, and then in terms of the maximum and minimum values for uh, the value tool, um, the max and min is just used for the, the y-axis in the value tool. Um, so we set the maximum pretty high at the beginning just to make sure that we were capturing um, kind of all of the surface reflectance values per pixel. And then the nice thing about um, the value tool is that when you toggle over each um, pixel, it, it provides you with that kind of spectral profile showing you um, the reflectance of each band on the x-axis, um, or sorry, wh what each band is on the x-axis and then the associated reflectance on the y-axis. Um, and that kind of auto uh, changes uh, the, the ranges within the uh, graph so that you're able to see each of those um, plots better. So we were kind of just um, manipulating the data there um, to get a better picture of, of what exactly we were seeing with reflectance. Um, so in terms of changing those max and min, it was purely just um, so that we could see uh, that spectral profile um, at each pixel a little bit better. And then if you want, I can actually go through um, question 27 as well. And that question was, is there any open source workflow available to atmospherically correct EO1 Hyperion data from level one to level two? So I'm not super sure if there's anything out there that's kind of a standard operating procedure, or something that's readily available um, and free. Um, but there are a lot of uh, workflows that I, I think might exist for things like CDAS um, through NASA and ESA SNAP. Those are just a couple of examples of um, kind of these space agents provided tools that are openly available that could potentially be used for atmospheric correction. Um, but a lot of the studies that we were reviewing, uh, particularly for Hyperion, um, tended to favor things like Flash, Acorn, Atrem, um, a lot of those uh, models that might not necessarily be super accessible um, in an open and free way, um, but tended to be kind of the standard that a lot of the studies were working with. Great, thank you, Zach, for that explanation. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And um, we will continue to go through these questions here. Um, Okay, question 28. Ah, does hyperspectral sensor sat, do, do hyperspectral set satellites have um, a, less swath? Um, and the, the general answer to that is yes. Uh, hyperspectral sensors tend to uh, have data taken over much smaller regions than multispectral sensors um, because we have to think again about the data limitations. Um, generally, they're covering a much smaller land area because the data they're collecting is much more dense in terms of the um, spectral uh, bands, right? So many of these sensors are collecting onwards of 200 bands. And so the area over which those data can be collected is typically smaller um, because if it were a much larger, if it were global, you can imagine how large those data sets would be. Um, and that's a big a big question with uh, upcoming missions like PACE or SBG. How do we deal with this massive amount of data? Uh, and how do they process the data? How do they store the data? Um, because if we are collecting hyperspectral data globally, 
it's a, it's a massive, it's a huge undertaking to properly uh, process and store these data. So yes, generally, high, generally for the past hyperspectral missions, the area over which the data are acquired are much smaller. Next question. Oh, I'm noticing we're almost at time here. So go through maybe uh, one more question and then we'll we'll get to uh, we'll get to some of these other questions. I know we have a lot here. We'll try to um, answer these in the document and post them on the website later. Um, but we'll do one more question and then we'll uh, we'll go through the rest of these and try to answer them offline and get them to you all. Um, question 29, um, not clear what target path and row are. Can you please explain? Um, yeah, this is something we cover generally in like a fundamentals of remote sensing class. And all that really uh, uh, tells you is uh, essentially the uh, path of the um, satellite uh, orbiting the Earth. So the path and the row are essentially ways to identify the latitude and longitude of a particular scene from a any kind of satellite image. So the designation will be different depending on the sensor you're looking at. Um, so for like Landsat and MODIS, there are very identifiable paths and row that, that are always going to be the same because the satellite is flying in the same orbit and acquiring imagery in the same um, in the same way across the globe over multiple orbits, right? So the path in the row is essentially just a system for identifying the location of a scene for a particular satellite system. And that's going to vary depending on the system of interest. Um, yeah, and we've included a link there for Landsat as a great example because it's a systematic path row is always going to be the same. Um, so it, it's actually a really great uh, feature in a lot of these data portals like Earth Explorer, where um, if you are familiar with your study region, you know you're going to know the path and row of a of a scene. Um, if you're looking at multiple images over time in one particular area, so you could just type in the path and row and it'll automatically direct you to the same region and then you can look at data over time from that same location. That's a really good question. Okay, um, well, I know we are at time and I wanna respect everyone's time here. So we will stop there. Uh, I wanna thank you for all of these questions. Um, very detailed questions, I love it. Uh, really getting at the heart of it. Um, even with an introductory level course, uh, we really appreciate your um, engagement in these trainings. Um, and for all of you to be staying on uh, for, for many of the questions, uh, we will get to the rest of them as we can and post this online. Uh, do please join us for the final session where we're going to talk about ocean and coastal applications. We will have another demo um, next week as well. Um, so do please come back and join us and uh, I want to thank everyone again for, for being with us. So have a great rest of your day.